All right, let's get started for today. Welcome to the second lecture of CS287, Advanced Robotics. Uh, one announcement today, which is that um, some of you are still hoping to get into the class, but not in the class yet. Um, we'll process all of that later tonight. So by tonight, you should hear from us whether you're in or out, and then hopefully you're in, but if you're out, at least you can move on and find another class to take. Any logistical questions? Great. Actually, can people in the back close the door? I'll keep it a little quieter in, in here. Any chance somebody there could close the door? Thank you. All right, today's topic is market decision processes. We'll see the framework. Then we'll look at um, exact solution methods. And then we'll look at a variation of the regular MDP formulation, the maximum entropy formulation. And that will be what we do today. So let's start with MDPs. What is an MDP? In an MDP, there's an agent. And the agent interacts with the world. And through interaction with the world, the agent's supposed to achieve some goals, um, often encoded in what is called a reward function. So for example, you might have an agent that is a cooking robot. That robot gets to interact with the environment. And it might get a high reward if it makes a good meal, a negative reward if it messes up your kitchen badly, and maybe really negative if it sets your kitchen on fire. Um, and so the reward is the way you specify what you want in an MDP. And then the agent's supposed to somehow act up against that in its environment. The agent here in an MDP gets to observe the state. So in this scenario, the robot would get to see where every object is in the room, get to know that. Um, that would be the state, um, its own pose, um, its own velocity, and so forth. So formally, what this looks like is an MDP consists of a set of states S. Um, Let's take a very simple example, a grid world with maybe nine squares. Then the set of states would be just nine states. Set of actions in a grid world it would be, let's say, move north, east, south, west, four actions. And then there's a transition model that tells you, given current state and action and current time, what's the distribution over next states? Now, often it will not depend on time because often the world is stationary. Um, but not necessarily, and we'll actually often see methods that take advantage of non-stationary aspects in the world um, to find a solution that's somewhat simpler to find that way. Reward function is dependent, can depend on state, action, next state, and also on time. In practice, often it'll only depend on state and maybe current action, but there's no reason it couldn't depend on all four. Discount factor gamma. This is a number between 0 and 1. And essentially, um, it encodes how much you care about now versus the further future. So what you're optimizing as an agent is some of discounted rewards shown here. And so the further in the future, the higher the power with gamma. And gamma is between 0 and 1. So the further in the future, the less you care. But how much less you care depends on gamma. If gamma is close to 1, you still care a lot about things far in the future. If gamma is close to zero, you pretty much only care about what's happening immediately. The goal is for the agent to find a policy, um, pi star, that maximizes this quantity over here. And so the remainder of lecture will essentially be about how do we find uh, this kind of policy. But before we dive into that, let's look at a few examples to make this more concrete. For example, a cleaning robot. Um, how could that be an MDP? Well, imagine you have a room. There's a robot in the room that's supposed to clean. Um, the state would be describing the position of the robot, maybe how full the vacuum bag is that the robot has, um, maybe where the dirt is in the room. And then the transition model would be defined as, well, something along the lines of if the robot moves, uh, tries to move in a certain direction, it'll have a high chance of moving in that direction, but maybe some chance of not exactly moving there. When it tries to suck up dirt that it's above, maybe it'll usually succeed, but not always succeed. And the reward could be something like um, how clean the room is. So 
negative reward for any dirt that's still in the room. You gotta be a little careful, by the way, when you choose your rewards, because a naive choice of reward could be something like, whenever you suck up dirt, you get reward. But the bad thing about that is that you could just dump dirt first, suck up dirt, dump it again, and go in a cycle where you just keep dumping and sucking up dirt, and actually you don't achieve the task that people wanted the robot to do. You're just achieving high reward, but on the wrong uh, reward, really. So that's a cleaning robot example. Walking robot. Maybe you want a robot that walks. Um, what could be the reward? Maybe distance covered. Maybe distance covered in a certain direction, if you care about it. Let's say, how far did the robot get north? And maybe you want to penalize for energy consumption. So maybe there's some negative reward related to how much energy you're consuming. Then pole balancing is an example you'll work on in your homework one. Um, you have a pole, and it's supposed to stay up. But if it's a little bit off, it'll start falling unless you apply a force, a torque in the motor that is at the bottom of the pole to get it back up. And so the reward there could be how far do you deviate from being perfectly upright? And the more negative, the more you deviate. And maybe there's also a negative reward for uh, applying torque, because the less torque you apply, the better, because the less energy you consume. A lot of games can be formulated this way. Um, game of Tetris, we have to put blocks into a rectangle. And if you have a full row at the bottom, it clears. Um, it's a decision problem. At any given time, there's some probability of a, which new block is going to show up. Then it shows up. Then you get to choose from actions where to place it and how much you want to rotate it before you place it. And then the process repeats. The reward is how many blocks you can place before you fill up to the top, at which point the game is over. Backgammon is a game where you roll dice and you play against an opponent um, to try to get your pieces to move across the board. And again, similar thing here. The rules of the game are the transition model. And then the reward is one for winning the game, negative one for losing the game, zero for a tie if that exists. It doesn't have to be in games or robotics. MDPs are really everywhere, and that's a kind of common thread I want to get across in this class, that the methods we're looking at, we're going to heavily study them for robotics, but they're actually much more widely applicable. For example, server management. You run a server that's supposed to maybe do some processing. Maybe it gets, um, I don't know, it runs a few processes. It has to query some classification on images, maybe some speech recognition, and maybe has to do some video classification. You get requests coming in. You have a bunch of servers. Onto which server do you schedule each of the incoming requests? And reward might be associated with, well, maybe some requests are more urgent. If you don't reply quickly with a response, that's a problem. Others are less urgent, so the reward um, will still be high, even if there's a little bit of delay before you reply, and so forth. Shortest path problems are MDPs. Um, it's a graph, let's say. And the transition model is deterministic. You can go to any neighboring state in the graph. That's your action space. Then um, to make it a shortest path problem, you'd say, well, maybe I get a reward of one once I'm at the destination, and zero otherwise. And then if you have discounting, then you have an extra encouragement to get to the destination as quickly as possible. Models for animal and, uh, animals and people are often done with MDPs. If you say, OK, how do I model, I don't know, a honeybee that's like living its life? Well, maybe you say, well, it has some dynamics it is constrained by, and then it likes to um, go to flowers, um, get, make, get the nectar, make honey, and the reward is probably related to something there. And if you have a model like that, you can more easily explain the behaviors that you're observing. So the canonical example for us will be this grid world over here. But I hope the previous example showed that this is not really about grid worlds, but grid worlds fit really nicely on slides and allow us to get concepts across very cleanly. Um, but again, we're going to you know, apply this in many, many other places. So in this grid world, we have an agent. And there are, it's a 4 by 3 grid. So in principle, there are 12 locations. But the gray one is a place you cannot go. So there's 11 locations the agent can be. For any location, the agent can choose to go north, east, south, or west. And has an 80% chance the action succeeds. Then there is a 10% chance you veer off to the left compared to what you wanted to do, 10% chance you veer off to the right. If your action leads you into the boundary of this space, it's supposed to be a wall surrounding this thing, then you stay in place. The reward is plus one if you're in the top square and take the exit action. And the reward is negative one if you're in this square here and you take the exit action. Everywhere else, the reward is zero. So what you'd hope for is that this agent 
if it finds the optimal policy, optimal policy would bring it to the top right square and then exit from there. And assuming the discount factor gamma is not one, so it's below one, so you want to be there sooner rather than later, you'd hope it follow the shortest path while also avoiding uh, falling into this trap over here. Because once you're here, the only action available is the exit action, same over there. So once you're there, you're stuck. And so going along this path is actually slightly risky because let's say you move up, you have 10% chance of moving off to the right, you land here, you'll have a negative one reward. All right, so what's also quite typical for MDPs and is the case here is that rewards often come at the end. Usually most of the reward is related to achieving goals, not always, but very often it is, and that's the case here. What does a policy look like? A policy is something that says for every time step, it's your first time step, second time step, tells you what is the action you're supposed to take. And the optimal policy is the one that optimizes expected reward. Why expected? Because the dynamics of the environment is stochastic, and so you can't count on a very specific reward to come out. It'll be on, on average, how much do you get? In contrast, let's say this environment was actually deterministic, then you could just choose a sequence of actions. You don't need a policy if the world is deterministic. You just say, I'm here, I'm gonna choose a sequence of actions that gets me where I wanna be, and I'm done. But typically the world will be stochastic and we need a policy, and that's what we're gonna focus on. Any questions so far about the formulation? Okay, so we covered the formulation. Let's now start looking at some solution methods. First one we're gonna look at is value iteration. And this is one of those things that um, I'm gonna do on the board and the kind of thing that we expect you to be able to do um, on your own. So I encourage you to um, follow along in the, in the derivation. Let's see. There we go. All right, so our first algorithm is value iteration. This is also the one we're gonna see the most of uh, throughout this lecture. So let's think about first some concept we want to solve this problem. First concept we want is V I star of S, which is the expected sum of discounted rewards is this big enough for the back no, no not big enough for the back <laughs> all right that was clear um, first concept is going to be v star i of s which is the expected, is this big enough? Thanks. Expected, discounted, sum of rewards if acting optimally. from state S for I steps. So we only have I steps left, and how much reward can we get if we act optimally for I steps when we get to start in state S? Okay, now, once we have this concept, let's start thinking about how we can compute this. The easy one is V0 star of S. We have zero steps left. There's no time left for us to act. There's nothing left to happen. So this is just gonna be zero because that's all there is, there's nothing. 
And this is going to be true for all states s. So now the question is, can we find a recursion where we find v1 from v0, v2 from v1, and so forth? So let's see. Um, what would be v i plus 1 star of s? Well, by definition, you expect that this counted sum of rewards if acting optimally from state s for i plus 1 steps. So, well, what happens? We get to take our first step, and after that, there will be i steps left. And so we're going to try to break it down into what happens in our first step, what happens afterwards. What happens in our first step is, well, we choose an action. We want to choose the best action. So, but for now, just say we choose an action. And after we choose that action, a transition happens. We have a transition from state s taking action a into state s prime with some probability t s a s prime. Then what happens at that moment? We get a reward for what just happened from that one time step. What happens after that is we have i steps left. And we're in state s prime. So when there's i steps left in state s prime, we're going to get another vi star, assuming we do optimal behavior then onwards, vi star s prime. But remember, we're doing discounting. Something that happens later is worth gamma less than something that happened earlier. So this is just a reward. But then here, what happens later gets discounted by a factor gamma. And so what we have here is now actually an update equation, assuming we pick the optimal action A. So let's parse this again. We're trying to compute the optimal expected sum of rewards from state S with i plus 1 steps left. We break it down into what happens first, which is we get a reward for the immediate transition. There actually could be many transitions, many possible next states S prime. So we're summing over all the possible next states S prime averaging the reward that we get. And then after that, we have i steps left. And so that's the recursion kicking in here. And we have a discount factor in front of it, because one step later is worth gamma less. We have gamma times vi star s prime. s prime, the same s prime we have here, averaged over all the possible states s prime we might visit. So how do we run value iteration? We just put a loop around this. We just say in it for all s, v0 star s equals 0. Then for i equals 0, 1, 2, up to h minus 1 for all s. And that will give us all the optimal values v star from 0 steps left all the way to capital H time steps left to act. Now the question you might have, this gives us values, and we've been talking about we want to find the optimal policy, the optimal strategy to behave in an environment. How do we get that? So if you look at this equation, it's already computing the best action. It'll compute this thing for all actions, right? So you'll do this multiple times. Once for each action, you compute this quantity. You'll have a table of values, and then you'll check which one is the highest. That's the one you pick. Well, the action that achieves that is the optimal action. And so to find the policy, we just need to change the max here into a argmax, and we'll have pi star i plus 1 of s equals argmax over a of the exact same quantity here. And then this, this update here is called a value update sometimes, or a Bellman update. or a Bellman backup after uh, Richard Bellman, who originated this set of equations. 
This is probably the most uh, important equation for today's lecture and next lecture. So let me pause here and make sure um, all questions are resolved around this. Yes? What's S'? Good question. What is S prime? So we're currently in state S, so S is the current state. When we take an action in the current state, the dynamics of the world will, will transition us into a next state. And S prime is the variable name we use to index into the state at the next time. So another way I could have written this um, is I could write this one as S at time t, let's say. And I could write this one as st plus 1, st, action on time t, st plus 1, and so forth. Um, but often just s prime is used because we don't want to pin it to particular times. Any other questions? Yes? Is t the probability of taking that action at that stage setting up the next stage? So, good question. So t here is equal to the probability of landing in state S prime given you were in state S and took action A. And so I should interchangeably use that notation at times. Sometimes we'll use T S A S prime, um, where T refers to transition model. And sometimes we'll use the explicit conditional notation P of S prime given S comma A. So the things we'll do on the board will also be in the slides that we share, but I think it's good to work through them more explicitly step by step than just flashing them in front of you, and I think it's good to take notes as we go along. Um, let's look at the example grid world. What happens if we run value iteration? Well, here we have run one update of value iteration. Remember this world. When you exit, when you're in one of these states, the only action available is exit. So one step available left to you in the life of your agent, that agent will exit from there, get the reward of negative one or plus one, depending on which state it was in, and that's the value. That's all it'll get for the rest of its life. Um, for the other states, the agent actually has options, can choose out of four actions. But no matter what action the agent chooses, with only one time step left, there will never be any reward encountered. So the value is zero, the optimal value is zero for all other states when there is one step to go. Um, in this case, the discount factor gamma is 0 0.9, which will uh, allow you to follow along with the math. Now, let's think about what happens when we have two time steps left. Well, let's think about it. What will happen down here? With two steps, you still can't get any non-zero reward. It'll stay zero. But up here, close to where the rewards are, where the non-zero values are for V1 star, there'll be opportunity for V2 star to be non-zero is will propagate from v1 to v2, v3, and so forth. So here's what happens. Let's parse this. Why is there a 0.72 up there? Why is the expected value of 0.72? Well, when it moves to the right, it has an 80% chance of success. So that's 0.8 times at the next time, it'll be able to exit and get a plus one reward. But the next time is discounted by 0.9. So it's 0.8, probability of success of getting there, then times 0.9 is 0.72. How come this one is zero and nothing negative, even though it's next to this one? Because it's finding the optimal values, and the optimal values will not put you into the negative state. Actually, what actually is happening here is it takes the optimal action, which is going this way, which 80% of the time keeps it in place, 10% of the time will go down, 10% of the time it'll go up, and that avoids it from ever landing here, and so it has a zero probability of landing here. And so at the next time, if it had landed here, it would get a negative one, which would be negative 0.9 with discounting. But that never happens. It actually ends up over there. But then only one step left, not enough time left to get that reward. Now, this is V2 star. How about, how about V3 star? We expect, again, it's going to propagate out because V3 star is computed from V2 star. Uh, you just have one extra step. And we see now that actually you have positive reward here. Why? Because you can now actually make it up there um, 
to the plus one. And so what happens here is you want to go up. Yes, there is some chance that you get a negative here by landing here, but that's a small probability. There's a much higher chance you end up here. And from there, you can actually uh, very likely make it there and get a good reward. And so the math works out that going up is the right thing to do um, to maximize your expected value. After four iterations, this is the values. One thing you might wonder is, um, well, I have a value here now of 0.66. Is this the final value? This is V star with four time steps left. Is V star with four time steps left the same as V star with, let's say, 100 time steps left? You're nodding no. Why not? Um, because you would, uh, you can go farther with 100 iterations. Yeah, so with 100 iterations, you can go farther. And how can this help you in this world? Let's think about this carefully. If it's a deterministic world and you run value iteration, this will just spread out cleanly and you'll immediately have the final value for something like this. But because it's a stochastic world, when you're here, you only have some probability of getting here for now. You still have probabilities of getting stuck along the way. And the more time you have, the more time you have to make up for that and still make it to the exit. And so as we keep iterating, you'll see that those values will actually keep going up um, over time. So here it's now 0.72 and also it's spreading out further away. And after 100 iterations, we're at this. Now discount factor gamma is 0 0.9. What that means is that effectively it's only looking 10 time steps into the future, maybe just a little more than 10 time steps. So at 100, you kind of saturated what's still going to happen, and it's pretty much converged. To this level of accuracy, it's converged at 1,000. It's exactly the same. Any questions about this example? Yes? OK, so yeah, good question. So look at the plus one reward cell. Initially, it's 0, of course, because we don't have enough time steps. Then here, we have an 80% chance by taking the right action to land into the plus one and then exit, which gives us 0.72. But we have a 10% chance to move up against the wall, which means stay in place. 10% chance of move down, which moves us down. That probability mass. If we have more time steps left, we can still guide that back into the target. And so when we have three time steps, when we had moved up and stayed in place, we actually still have enough time to try again to go off to the right. And that's what happens here. And that's why it goes up. Yes? Absolutely. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, why is this zero? It's zero because, well, let's first think about why it might not be zero. Let's just say, well, why, why wouldn't we think this thing tries to move up, but sometimes it's unlucky, it lands here, and with 10% chance, and then with discounting would be um, 0.9 times 0.1 negative of that, so we'd have negative 0 0.09 there. And that would be the case if your policy is to move up here. But actually, the optimal policy here moves this way, bumps into the wall to never end up over there with the negative 0 0.09. So why is the arrow pointing up? So yeah, that's a good question. The way this visualization is done is actually it's visualizing a one-step look-ahead policy. So if it's essentially looking at the policy if you had one more step than the value function that's shown. We haven't really covered that yet, but we'll, we'll cover it in the future. OK, so it turns out there's a theorem that says value iteration is guaranteed to converge. And at convergence, we will have found the optimal value function v star for the discounted infinite horizon problem, which satisfies the Bellman equations shown here. Let's look at some intuition behind why this is converging. I mean, in some sense, it makes sense for us that we are getting optimal values for i steps left, i plus 1 steps left, but why will this reach some steady state value and not kind of keep changing forever? Well, first, let's, let's see what we can conclude from this. We're good to go. That means if we have infinite horizon, 
we can just run this till convergence and we'll have a V star for infinite horizon and we can use the optimal policy against that, pi star, and we don't need to store a table for every time step. Um, we can just have a single policy for all time steps. Of course, this assumes the dynamics and the reward um, don't change over time. Um, so this is what we can do. And this is the one step look ahead I was talking about. Once you have an optimal value function or any value function you prefer to act against, this is the one step look ahead operation you can do to find the optimal action. So we're all set in that regard. Um, and we only need to store either V star and do this look ahead at every time step, or we can just do this as we compute V star, we're computing already the max, we can store the arg max and just store our optimal policy in doing so. Let's look at some intuition behind the convergence. Actually, let's see, is there any questions about the theorem statement? Essentially, it's just saying that if you're in value iteration long enough, at some point, the values stop changing, they're converged. And they satisfy that equation at that point. OK, so what's the intuition? V star is the ex expected sum of rewards accumulated starting from state s, acting optimally for infinitely many steps. V star h of s is the expected sum of rewards accumulated starting from state s, acting optimally for h steps. So when we say it converges, what it really means is that if we make this h big enough, at some point, h and h plus 1 are the same. v star h and v star h plus 1 are essentially the same. And that's v star of s. So we can think about it. Well, we computed v star h of s. What additional reward, if we could act longer, what additional reward could we be collecting by getting to act longer? Um, because that's really going to make the difference between the optimal value function and the one that we have for only horizon h. So, well, we're going to get discount factor gamma to the power h plus 1 times reward for time h plus 1, then similar for time h plus 2, and so forth. This quantity here is smaller than if we replace the rewards that we actually get with the max reward that's available in the MDP. So let's assume there's some max. You can never get more than a certain max. Around, for example, plus 1 in the MDP we saw. Now this summation in the back here has a geometric series in it and can be bounded by gamma to the h plus 1 over 1 minus gamma. So what this shows is that if we had more time, the best extra reward we could get is this much. Now, if we look at this quantity and how it depends on h, as h goes to infinity, this quantity goes to 0. So if my h is already very large, the extra I could have gotten from getting to act longer is near 0. If what I could have gotten extra from acting longer goes to 0, then that means that the difference between v star h and v star s go to 0 because v star h is the best I can get with h time steps, and v star is what I can get with infinitely many time steps, but if there's essentially nothing left by having more time steps, then they're going to be the same. And so this is a kind of fairly intuitive proof as to why value iteration will converge to infinite horizon value function. What I put up here is assuming the rewards are always positive. Um, but you can go through the same reasoning when there are negative rewards, and then um, or negative and positive, and the R max here, what it would really mean is the max absolute value of reward that you can get anywhere, and then the same reasoning will go through. All right, this is kind of a very intuitive uh, proof sketch. Let's look at another angle that people often look at to prove value iteration converges. So we'll define something called a max norm. And the reason we see two versions of, a, I mean, two proofs for the same thing is that just in different contexts, a different intuition might be more useful. So max norm is the max absolute value of any entry in your vector. So if you had a value function or an attempted value function that you hope was the real value function u, then it would be a vector with entries for every state. And the max norm of that vector would be the maximum absolute value of all entries in that vector. Then 
There's a notion called contractions, and specifically gamma contraction in max norm. So what are we thinking about here? It's we have a operation, the value update operation. We do one iteration in value iteration. We have a vector of values, and now we have a new vector of values. That's the update operation. Question is, for any update operation, you can ask, is it a contraction or not? And so we're going to define what a contraction is. A contraction is this notion that if no matter what two vectors you have, let's say you run value iteration, but you take two different initializations. You don't initialize with zero. You just take two completely different initializations, ui and vi. Then you do one update. You might wonder, do these things move closer together? And a contraction is exactly defined that way. If you have two things, two things, you do an update to them. Do they move closer together? Are they a factor gamma closer together after the update? This is just the definition of a gamma contraction. This is not any property of value iteration yet, but it's just a definition. Now, the property, though, that's important in this theorem is that a, a contraction converges to a unique fixed point no matter the initialization. We're not going to prove that here. Uh, the proof is probably one page of work that you can try on your own. Um, but it's generally true. Once you know, show something as a contraction, you know if you keep applying that operation, it'll get to a fixed point, a unique fixed point. Fact, and again, we're not going to prove this, but it's not too hard to prove. Value iteration updates form a gamma contraction in the max norm. And the intuition here is fairly simple in that imagine you have two vectors, ui and vi and they undergo a value iteration update. Where are ui and vi used? They're only used with a gamma in front of them. So the effect of the original ui and vi gets downscaled by a factor gamma. And then the reward in front is shared anyway across all. So the effect of the ui and vi gets downscaled by a factor gamma. And that's how you essentially prove that a value iteration update is a gamma contraction in max norm. Corollary, value iteration converges to a unique fixed point. Additional fact is that once your updates are changing the value function very little, you can do a bit of math to show that then also you're close to the optimal value function v star. And this is actually very related. Showing that is very similar to showing that um, contractions converge to a unique fixed point. You essentially look at um, two vectors that come after each other in the update, and then you put this on this side, and then on here, you'll have the plus two and the plus one, and that, that's kind of the way you show convergence of a contraction. And it allows us to have a stopping criterion when we run value iteration. If you say, I want to values up to a certain level of accuracy, well, you just check, what's the biggest change in any of my values am among my states? And then I, I call that epsilon, I plug it into this, and I know that I'm within that much of the optimal value function. All right. Yes? Sorry, what's the U function again? So in this case, the top row U is just any vector, because it's just defining the norm of a vector. Then here, UI and VI are again vectors of the same size. And then an update operation gets applied to them. And that gives us ui plus 1 and vi plus 1. So ui gets updated to ui plus 1. vi gets updated to vi plus 1. And we're talking about that update operation being a contraction even only if this thing holds true. Yes? Uh, For this to be true, yes. To be a contraction, gamma has to be smaller than 1. Correct. Otherwise, things will not shrink together. They can, then, if gamma equals 1, it's called a non-expansion. And then, I guess, bigger than 1, it can expand. So then there's not much we can do. Yes? Does the additional fact imply anything about the rate of convergence of value iteration? Like linear, yeah. exponential, et cetera? Um, this, essentially, the rate of convergence is the contraction rate gamma. Okay. So you will, you will be able to define the, the speed at which you go to V star. Essentially, the, as you power up gamma, that's what will get you the rate at which you converge. Uh, sorry, can you further explain like, on the additional fact, how do you get from the left side to the right side? 
on the additional fact, this thing here we didn't prove. That's left for you to try out if you want to try it out. It's, it's not, you're absolutely right, it's not, you can't just stare at it and just be like, this is obvious. It's, it's pretty complicated, it turns out. Um, but it's um, kind of, as you imagine, the starting point is going to be something along the lines of you look at, um, you do something with adding and subtracting v star here, and then use some triangle inequality and play around with a few things, and at some point you can uh, get this out. But yeah, it's, you're not expected to necessarily be able to do this. Um, otherwise, we would cover it in class. How is the right hand side useful? How is this round? This is useful in the sense that you now know if you, if your update changes your value function only a little bit, let's say epsilon, then you know that you are two epsilon gamma over one minus gamma close to v star. So it's giving you a guarantee that once your value function doesn't change much anymore, you are close to the optimal value function v star. Okay, let's look at a couple of examples of um, problems and how the parameters affect the optimal solution. So what we're gonna look at here is a grid world of this structure where you get negative 10 when you land over here, once you exit, and the only option you have here is to exit, plus 10 over here, and then one over there. So there's a nearby small reward, a far away higher reward, and then there's also this danger zone at the bottom. Um, and so the question is, how can we get different policies out? So how can we define this problem by choosing different discount factors and different um, noise levels on the action? So noise equals 0 0.5 means that 50% chance you succeed with your action, and then 25% chance you veer off to the left, 25% chance you veer off to the right. Um, gamma is still the discount factor. Noise equals zero means you always succeed with your action. Exactly the action you choose is what you get. You choose north, it goes north. And so the question is, here are eight, oh, sorry, eight, eight bullet points, but here are four scenarios. Prefer the closest exit, risking the cliff, so this path. Prefer the closest exit, but avoiding the cliffs along the top go to closest exit. Prefer the distant exit, risking the cliff this way, or prefer the distant exit, avoiding the cliff, go along the top to distant exit. And um, question for you is, which of these choices of MDP parameters will map onto those optimal solutions? So I'll give you kind of two minutes to talk with your neighbor and make up your mind on how left column might match up with which entry in the right column. All right, let's see what um, you came up with. So for A, prefer the close exit, meaning the plus one, risking the cliff, so the bottom path up there. Um, who thinks one? Nobody thinks one. Who thinks two? Nobody. Who thinks three? Nobody. Who thinks four? Oh, wow. Overwhelming four. 
Um, everybody raised their hand on four, so why four? Um, well, you have a pretty harsh discount um, and no noise. So you're going to want to find a solution pretty quickly, uh, and you have absolute control. So. so the answer was you have a very harsh discount, so you want to get your reward sooner rather than later. And you have no noise, so it's not that risky to go along the cliff, so you just follow the shortest path. Great. How about um, B, prefer to close exit but avoiding the cliff? Who thinks one? Who thinks two? Three? Four? Shouldn't pick four anymore at this point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> most people said one. Olivia, do you, you want to say why? So Olivia said, um, harsh discount factor here, which makes us prefer the close one, but we can't risk the cliff because there's a lot of noise, much higher chance to falling into it if we go that way. Great. Um, how about the third one? Prefer a distant exit risking the cliff. Um, one, two, a lot of people two, three, four. Okay. So. Risking the cliff, same story here. We picked two, why? Because noise is zero, so risking is not really that risky. In fact, you know you're not gonna fall into it. And then you might as well take the shortest path. Um, gamma is 0 0.99, so you're willing to spend the extra time to get to the later reward, because it's 10 times bigger and you get discounted only by 0 0.99 to the power uh, two or three or something. Then that leaves us with for D, the only option left, which is um, three. And same story here, we're willing to go further because the discount is close to one and there's only a couple of extra steps needed and it's a factor 10 more reward and there is noise so we want to take the longer path. Great. So we covered value iteration which is the main method uh, we wanted to cover. Let's take a two or three minute break here and then in the second half of lecture we'll uh, go through the remainder of what's on that slide. So I'm trying to follow you, mm -hmm. but I kind of have to stop where the screen comes down. Because when I point the camera at the screen, mm -hmm. it's like it's on auto exposure. I so see. it kind of gets blown out. And uh -huh. also, uh, for people following the video, um, I mean, it's up to you, but rather than maybe pointing at the actual screen using your like trackpad and point at something on the screen, mm -hmm. the video will pick that up. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes sense. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You're saying essentially up to here is fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got like, it. Because you're, you're getting blown out by the additional light coming in. To uh -huh. the, uh, Got the, it. The mm -hmm. cool. Thanks. I just okay. have a question about some of the couple slides. But the, mm -hmm. the one we're looking at max and one. All right, let's uh, restart. Any questions about the first half of lecture? All right, we've seen the foundation, most of the foundation for today's lecture. Um, so we can actually go a little faster in some of the next pieces. Um, first thing we'll look at is policy evaluation. So we're still trying to solve for the optimal way to act in a MDP, but we're gonna find a new algorithm to do it. And why do we need more than one algorithm? Well, sometimes in the future when we're solving problems that we cannot solve exactly and we need to do approximate solutions, in some cases we'll be easy to build on one method, in other cases we'll be easy to build on another method. Um, so, 
Policy evaluation is the notion that given a policy, you want to know how much reward do I expect to get when using that policy. And so remember, value iteration has this update equation here. It's against the optimal policy. Um, so what if we fix the policy? Well, that's actually very easy. All we need to do is to not give access to the max over there. We get rid of the max over there, and we can evaluate the current policy. So we just replace the max with a, well, the policy pi prescribes an action A in state S, pi of S, and we fill that in there, and there's no max anymore. Other than that, this is the exact same equation. And so actually, the exact same ideas apply. Will policy evaluation converge? Yes, because it's like value iteration just in an MDP where in each state only one action is available. And so right away we have a proof of convergence right there. At convergence, um, policy evaluation will satisfy this equation, which is the Bellman equation just without the max because, well, the policy prescribes the action in each state. We have no choice. Now this is just evaluation. And with just evaluation, we can't necessarily um, uh, find an optimal policy yet, but let's pause on this for a moment and see what happens if we generalize this to a stochastic policy. Okay, so this was all deterministic. How about stochastic? Um, we now have a policy mu, which is a mu a given s is a probability of taking action a in state s, and we have three proposed policy evaluation update equations here. So. Which policy evaluation update equation do you think is the correct one? One, two, or three? I'll give you a moment to stare at this. We're doing policy evaluation. Policy is mu a given s, probably of action a being in state s is mu a given s. OK, let's, let's see. Um, who thinks one? Who thinks two? A bunch of people think two. Who thinks three? A bunch of people think three. Most people thought two. Let's think through this. Let's look at two, which was the majority. Um, in two, what do we see? Um, we have a sum over next states, um, which we expect to see, because that's what's in these update equations. Then we have a sum over actions. Why is there a sum over actions here? Because there's no fixed action. We don't use a specific action. We use a distribution over actions. And so mu a given s is the probability of that action in state s. And then after that, essentially the transition of landing in state s prime given state s in action a. So indeed, equation two is a generalization from a fixed action to a distribution over actions for the update equation. All right, that was a little aside to make sure you're familiar with the notation. Um, by the way, why, why is number three incorrect? It also has a summation over actions, but it has a max over states. And you don't get to choose the next state S prime. The next state S prime is a consequence of the transition model. And so you don't get that access. If you were in an MDP where you got to choose the next state S prime, then equation three could be your update equation potentially, but you don't get to choose the next state S prime. So you don't get to max over it. What is policy iteration? In policy iteration, we alternate between policy evaluation and policy updates, policy improvements. Policy evaluation is what we saw on the previous slide. Um, let me, so this part over here. Then policy improvement is the equation we see at the bottom. What is that doing? That's something with a max again. It's saying if I get to act k plus one steps, from state S, I'm going to do a one-step look ahead. I'm in state S. Initially, I get some reward for the transition that happens. And after that, I get discount factor gamma times a value I will get then onwards for using the policy that I had pi k. So I have a current policy pi k for which I computed the values. And I'm going to say, I'm assuming I'm going to use that policy pi k for the last k steps that I get to act. But for the very first step, my very first step, I get to override an action and choose the best one for that very first one and then continue with pi k. That's the policy update. It's kind of interesting um, because it's somewhat non-intuitive that, that this maybe is guaranteed to be the right thing to do. But here, here's the intuition why this is going to be a better policy. The reason it's going to be a better policy is because, well, let's first think about the following notion. Let's say we use pi k for k steps, the last k steps, and just use pi k plus 1 for the very first step. Then definitely pi k plus 1 first followed by pi k is better because, well, 
Um, it's the max of our expected value that we choose the action based on rather than just sticking to pi k. So it's definitely better that way. Now you can actually repeat this reasoning. You can say, if, sorry, I phrased it slightly wrong. We'll use pi k for in infinitely many steps afterwards, not just k steps. Infinitely many steps afterwards, we'll use pi k. OK, so it's better to first use pi k plus 1, followed by infinitely often pi k, than just pi k at all times. After I do that, I'm at the next time. I had committed to using pi k, but what if I just again say, well, what about from the next step onwards I'm committed to pi k, but right now I still give myself the choice to take the best action possible, assuming I'll use pi k infinitely often then onwards. That again will be strictly better. And I can repeat this thought process at every time step. And ultimately what that means is that I'm using this pi k plus 1, this new policy, at every time step. And I've shown that's strictly better than using pi k at every time step. So this is indeed a policy improvement step. Keep in mind, v, the k index here, just, just to be clear, and I, I had a small lapse there, so I want to make sure to clarify it. k here indexes into iteration of the algorithm. We have, and the algorithm iterate, iterates over current policy pi k, find the value for that policy that will take infinitely many value iteration updates or till convergence. After we've done that, we do a policy iteration update and the index k goes up. And then we repeat. OK, so here's what happens. This repeat, we repeat this until the policy converges. And that converges with the optimal policy. And actually converges faster under some conditions than value iteration. Now, one quick thing that I want to note here is that um, for now, we just looked at modified Bellman updates to evaluate a policy. But actually, if you look at this, at the end when it's converged, this is an equation that's satisfied. And that equation is linear in vi pi. So we can actually just solve a linear system of equations instead. So when you run policy iteration, when you do policy evaluation, you can either solve a linear system of equations to find your v pi for your current policy pi. Or you can just run policy evaluation iteratively like we did for value iteration and find your v pi that way. Now, theorem says that policy iteration is guaranteed to converge. And at conversions, the current policy and its value function are the optimal policy and optimal value function. Why is that? Let's start with the second bullet point in the proof sketch here. It's optimal at convergence. Why? By definition of convergence, pi k plus 1 equals pi k. What that means is that when you look at the Bellman update here, the value iteration update for pi k, and we take the max there, that the max action is the action already prescribed by pi k. So what we have is that the policy pi k is already prescribing the best action. Nothing changes. That's what happens at convergence. So when, by just looking at the equation, we know when the action doesn't change anymore that the policy prescribes, it's actually satisfying the Bellman equation, so we're optimal, and we're done. Now, the question you might ask is, well, are we guaranteed to ever have this equation be satisfied and that nothing changes anymore? And the intuition behind that is actually very simple. We discussed on the previous, previous slide that pi k plus 1 will be better than pi k, or at least as good. Well, if every time we have a new policy, it's better than the previous one, and there's only a finite number of policies to choose from, at some point, we're out of options. Because we can't cycle around when things have to always improve. So at some point, we're out of options. That's guaranteed. So we must converge at some point. And then we know when we converge that we're actually at the optimal, at the optimal point from the second bullet point. All right, this might be a lot to wrap your head around. But um, if you haven't seen any of this before, but I encourage you to kind of slowly read this again at your own pace and see what you think. Next, we're going to actually skip over linear programming. We will do that at, at the end. Um, and we're going to look at the maximum entropy formulation. So let's look at a bigger grid world. And we're going to watch value iteration happening here. We'll see contours. Well, values on the left, red is high value. The exit state is the bottom right. The black squares are uh, obstacles. And then on the right, what you see is a bunch of rollouts from various initial states of the agent kind of see what the policy is. And so as we run this, 
actually, hold on, let me pause this for a moment. As we run value iteration, what will happen is, at some point, we will find an optimal strategy for every starting point, the optimal strategy, very specific strategy we follow to get to the goal. If now somebody changes the world and puts a new obstacle in, the strategy we found might not work anymore, and we only found one strategy, the optimal one. And that might be okay if you know that that's fine. You only need to find that one strategy. You know the world's never going to change. It's always exactly what you expect it to be. What if the world's not exactly what you expect it to be? That can be the case if your MDP is not a perfectly matched up thing with the real world. Well, now what can happen is um, the optimal policy will fail, and you have nothing at that point. And so a question could be, well, is there any way to solve for a distribution over solution, so a distribution over things you might want to do, rather than a single solution? Naturally, if there's only a single optimal one, these other ones will be near optimal. They will not be the optimal one. But can we find that? Because if we find that, then if something small changes in the world, we're already ready to deal with that. OK, so let's think about this for a moment. How are we going to encourage um, somehow that we don't just find the optimal? We're going to use the notion of entropy. So what is entropy? Entropy is this quantity shown over here, mathematical quantity. What it measures is the uncertainty of a random variable x. Random variable x, distribution p of x. How much uncertainty do you have over x when I just tell you you're going to get a sample from x, but I don't tell you yet what I have sampled. How much uncertainty do you have? That's what's measured in the entropy. So if we can have a high entropy for our optimal policy, which then would be a policy that is non-deterministic at this point, it'll be a distribution over actions it outputs. If we have a high entropy for our policy, then we'll have a distribution over actions, distribution over paths we might follow. And of course, we don't ju we'll not just want high entropy, we'll also want high rewards. So we'll do a trade-off between the two. Now, entropy is kind of a very informa information theoretically justified way of measuring the kind of uncertainty over a random variable x. Uh, for example, if you need to encode um, samples from a distribution, you would, information theoretically speaking, want to do it with a specific sample xi. You would use a number of bits, log lo 2 log of 1 over p of xi, and that's the optimal way to encode. The info theory Aspects don't really matter too much to us, but we want to have an intuition over the notion what entropy is. So for a distribution where x could be 1 or 0, and there's a probability associated with being 1, we can plot the entropy as a function of that probability. Horizontal axis probability x equal 1. When the probability of x equal 1 is 0, you're always 0. Then there's 0 entropy. There's no uncertainty. When you're always 1, there is no uncertainty. But when your probability is 0 0.5, you have the most uncertainty, entropy is the highest. Here's another example, two distributions where x can take on five values. Which one has higher entropy? Well, which one gives you more uncertainty about what x is going to be? The one on the right, you actually know usually it's going to be that first value, so that's lower entropy. Whereas the one on the left, it's really spread out fairly evenly, so it's going to be higher entropy. And you can actually compute this. You can work through the math for those specific values and take the sum p log 1 over p and get the values. And indeed, the one on the left has higher entropy than the one on the right. So now that we have this notion of entropy, which qualifies uncertainty, we can see a new, formulations, new formulation of how to solve MDPs, namely the maximum entropy formulation. We used to solve for a policy that maximizes expected sum of rewards. Now we're going to try to solve for a policy that not just maximizes expected sum of rewards, but also maximizes entropy of the policy. And beta here is a coefficient. If you make beta very high, then you care a lot about entropy. If you make beta equal 0, you get back to the original case. And if you make beta equal to infinity, then all you care is about entropy, and you'll just ignore the reward. And in between is where the interesting regime is, where you'll have a trade-off between entropy and reward, and you'll get a range of strategies emerging of how to solve the problem rather than a single strategy. So can we do something like value iteration for the max entropy version? Well, let's see. Actually, first we need a little intermezzo on constrained optimization. Um, so let me write something on the board here for constraint optimization. And we'll need that to be able to solve the problem we're going to solve. So let's see. Oops. 
we'll see a lot more constraint optimization in the uh, future lectures. Today we'll just see something very simple but a concept that we already need today. So constraint optimization is where you have a problem where you try to find a variable x or maybe a vector valued variable x that maximizes some function f of x subject to some constraint g of x equals 0. A very specific case we're looking at here, but this is the one we care about. How are we going to solve this? Um, well, the concept people use a lot is called a Lagrangian. And we'll solve this problem by solving this problem instead. Max over x still. Then min over a new variable, lambda, of the Lagrangian of x and lambda, which is equal to, we'll rewrite the max over x, rewrite the min over lambda, g, no, f, f of x plus lambda times g of x. So why is this solving the original problem? Let's think about it. Let's say for this max min problem, we choose a x where g of x is not equal to 0. Well, after I choose my, my x where g of x is not equal to 0, the minimizer get to choose lambda. And if x is not equal to 0, minimize will just choose lambda. If x is positive and wants to minimize, we'll choose lambda negative. Very, very negative and drive this really, really negative. And actually, this one will probably choose, essentially, if g of x is positive, we'll choose negative infinity. If g of x is negative, we'll choose positive infinity to drive this to, z to as negative a value as possible. So we're forced in this problem to pick an x that has g of x equal to 0, which we're also forced to do here. So you don't know yet why this is useful, but I'm just trying to clarify why this is equivalent at this point. This is equivalent because we can still not pick an x where g of x is not equal to 0. And once we pick an x where g of x is equal to 0, well, then this disappears, and we're just maximizing f of x. So we have an equivalent problem here to the orig original problem. You might say, doesn't it look more complicated? Maybe it does, but actually it doesn't. Um, because the way we can now find a solution um, is by saying at the solution is going to be the case that the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x will be equal to 0. Because if it's not, I should move x in the direction that makes this thing higher because I'm maximizing with respect to x. And the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to lambda should also be equal to 0. Because if it's not equal to 0, then I should move it in a direction that makes this thing lower because we're minimizing respect to lambda. So we know that these are properties satisfied by the solution. And so often it'll be easier to write out those two equations when we try to solve something and see if we can read off the solution to the problem from those two equations. And we'll see that in a moment. We can do that for maximum entropy formulations. And then from there, um, we have a solution. Okay, so that was a very brief thing on um, constraint optimization. We'll now use that to solve the max n problem. And this will be the second most important derivation for this class. All right, so instead of deriving the actual max end value iteration, I'm going to derive a simpler version where we can see all the insights necessary to find a solution, and we can just reuse that template to do the actual max end value iteration. So we're going to look at max 
over pi of a, it's distribution over actions, expected value, of the reward we get from taking action a, plus beta times the entropy of our distribution over actions pi of a. So this is a one-step problem rather than a many-step problem, but we'll see, just like with some value iteration, it's just like a one-step thing that you repeat many times. Same thing will be true here. Okay, so this is the same as um, max over pi of a. Expected value is sum over pi, sorry, sum over a, pi of a r a, then plus but entropy has this negative thing in it, so it's going to be a negative, negative, beta, sum over a, pi of a, log, pi of a. And I know entropy has a two log instead of a regular log, but I'm just going to ignore that because a, any kind of base for the log is just a multiplicative factor, and so we'll just assume that lives inside beta. We don't worry about it. Well, and there is a constraint. The constraint is such that sum over a pi a equals 1. And there's also another constraint that the pi a should be positive. We will see that when we solve it without those constraints, it'll still come out with them being positive, so we don't have to worry about it. So let's write out the Lagrangian. What's our Lagrangian? Um, we're going to do max over pi of a min over lambda of the Lagrangian, which is sum over a pi a r a minus beta sum over a pi a log pi a plus lambda for the constraint. What is our g of x here? It's essentially this thing equal 1 is the same thing as this thing minus 1 equals 0. So plus lambda sum over a pi of a minus 1 shows up here. Now we take our derivatives. Let's do derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to pi of a. And we're going to want to set this equal to 0. What do we end up with? Well, first thing here, look at the derivative. This gives us r of a. This thing gives us minus beta times um, if we have this thing, we have log pi of a. For the other one, derivative log 1 over the thing, so that's a plus 1. And then here, plus lambda. We want this equal to 0. Or if we rewrite this, we want beta log pi of a equal to r of a minus beta plus lambda, or pi of a equal to e to the power 1 over beta r of a minus beta plus lambda. So that's what we find for our pi of a. So we see that we have essentially the reward of gets exponentiated, the more reward, the more likely we take a certain action. And then what's really happening here, the minus beta plus lambda, that's just a scale factor and doesn't depend on A. So we can actually rewrite this just as well as equal to 1 over Z, which is the scaling, E to the 1 over beta R of A. That's what we find, where Z is something that makes sure things sum to 1. Um, and actually, if we take the derivative with respect to lambda here of the Lagrangian is sum over a pi a minus 1 equals 0, we see that we exactly get back out the notion that things should sum to 1. Um, what we see here is the solution is in a really nice form factor. It's if beta were equal to 1, let's simplify this, beta equal to 1, we just have e to the reward as our probability, and then some normalization. So that's really nice. Then, what we can do is 
we can actually take that solution for pi of a and put it into here and see what is the actual optimal value that we achieve in the max end environment. So this is a derivation that was on the board. We're going to plug the expression for pi of a into the maximization up there, the objective. It's a bit of math you have to work through, but it's really straightforward kind of simplification type math. There's no new concepts there. If you work through all the simplifications, what you get is that the objective value at optimum equals beta times log sum exp 1 over beta ra. Let's again imagine beta equals 1. Then what we have here is essentially a soft way of computing a maximum. So rather than taking, just with all the probability mass on the one action that achieves the highest reward, we take a soft max in the policy, and we get this log exp of the values as the actual value. It's a very simple update to do. Like we did a bunch of math, but ultimately it's very simple. If you want to know the optimal value for this thing, it's just log sum exp reward. If beta is closer to zero when you don't care about entropy, then the exponent will grow. And so the exponents will become more extreme. And whichever had the highest reward will have grown the most, will be even bigger than the others, more bigger than the others, and will dominate, and will have more and more probability associated with it, and will dominate this value. When beta goes to zero, you don't care about, well, that's a beta to zero. When, you, when beta goes to infinity, the opposite way, you don't care about reward anymore, you'll get the uniform distribution, and all you get is the entropy of the uniform distribution as your value of the problem. Let's see. Um, actually, this is a pretty important concept. So I'm going to stop here. And next time, we'll see how to generalize this to full value iteration. Uh, see you on Thursday. <laughs>